burr. It's burr in the shop. I don't know what it is, 6 o'clock in the morning, I think. Kind of random, I just uh, looked down at my desk. And there's a tuft of animal fur. Sitting on my desk. Very random. How to get there. There's cats around here, but I can't, uh... I can't, uh, tell exactly what this is yet. Hopefully it's not from my wolverine hide out there, but either, either way... There's no, uh, leather attached to it. Kind of weird. I'll get to the bottom of that soon. <sighs> I'm behind. I'm behind. I'm doing what I do in here. But, as to be expected, this is the chaos time of the year for me here. Always has been, always will be. No big deal. Uh, yeah, we had to go out to the coast yesterday and deal with the boat. Get it out of the water. It was supposed to be out of the water a month ago, but we got it out yesterday. And uh, carried on. What else? What else? What else? What else? I'm not awake yet. It'll come to me. So I, the one other thing I had to do was shoot a couple of my rifles. And I went to go into the shop and grab a piece of cardboard, the right one. I seen a couple pieces of cardboard up against the shop wall here with a bunch of items. Some items that have been sent to me. And I am, I suck at items sent to me. I suck at gifts. I've admitted it before. I don't know why it makes me uncomfortable. It just does, although I appreciate all the kinds from everybody. I don't know what my problem is. Anyway. I grabbed a piece of cardboard and there was something in it. I have a feeling I'm behind in whatever it is. And look at this, it was something sent to me. Hope you can see that on the camera. It's one of those old uh, ammunition advertisements. And it's a grizzly bear with a piece of cloth. A cowboy hat falling off the cliff and a rifle. I guess he got him. Almost. Pretty cool. And, uh... Rare. Oops. Buckles. And there's a letter with it. Let me read this. Use my name is fine with me. Hi, Steve and Sarah. Several weeks ago, I was freshly retired. I cut my cable TV and discovered YouTube. My tastes were mainly of outdoor nature, so the algorithms brought me to how to hunt. This guy named Steve was telling a story and mentioned a crummy. I thought if this dude's know what a, if the, I thought if this dude knows what a crummy is, he's got to be all right. So this sign reminded me of another story of yours, the bullet in the chamber all season in your 300. I knew I had to send it to you. It might work nice in the man cave. I always suspected Bigfoot was real. Based on the sheer numbers of sightings and experiences, I spent a lot of time in the woods, grew up on a 40-acre rural ranch 30 miles from the Canadian border. Been lucky, I guess. I never had a personal interaction. Yeah, you're lucky. So far. So, enjoy your sign. Help you see the humor. So, you guys are doing a great job with the channel. No comments on my new hat yet, but I expect some soon. Thanks, you guys. Paul Cooper, Mead, Washington. P.S. Just an opinion about the how to hunt and how to be great with a Canadian flag, like on the back. All right, Paul, I appreciate that, man. That's a cool thing for the shop for sure. Right behind the grizzly skull. Absolutely appreciate that, man. And uh, I'm glad you're enjoying your hat. Canadian flag? Mm hmm. Touchy subject these days here in Canada, <laughs> right? I wish there was a flag for all the people of the world. Just a people flag. I'd be a big fan of that one. Real big fan of that one. Now, as I'm slowly waking up, I gotta get my chickens done. Too bad the pressure washer idea was a fail, but how do you find out if things uh, work or not, unless you try? And if you didn't fail, you wouldn't go anywhere in life, right? One thing I noticed last night when we were driving down the road um, was Jehovah Witness Church up the road has security. There's security all over the place. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And Sarah said that on Halloween, Jehovah, the church, JW churches, whatever you want to call it, 
they have to get security around the churches on Halloween. I did not have a clue. <laughs> kind of took me back a little bit. I'm like, huh? What? I guess kids must go on egg pelting binges or something. I don't know what they do. Who knows? I don't know. It's just kind of weird for me to see that. Security for the church on Halloween. Now, what else? I get a lot of people ask me about some of the stuff behind me on the wall. And, um... These are memories. Everything that are everything that I put on my walls in my shop, whatever, they're just they're memories for me. They're very special memories for me. And they take me back to that day in, in my life. And I excuse me, I relive the memory. I relive the moment. I remember I relive every single scent, feeling, sound, and smell of that day. And it's very they are all very special days to me. And some of the significant ones I'll I, uh, I like to have close to me like this particular deer right here for the curious. For the hunters out there, this is a black-tailed deer. It probably would have been the largest recorded, recorded if I recorded it in British Columbia had it had a missing tine in the back. No big deal. Don't give a shit. But it's a memory for me. And these are two big mule deer over here. They were great memories as well. That's what that is. It's a black-tailed deer. And, uh... So all of you know my stance on dead animal parts. If you're if you are curious or maybe you're not curious, and especially for all you hunters out there, I don't know how many people are still here that are were hunters from the original beginning of this channel. I know a lot of hunters that don't want anything to do with this topic, don't want to hear about it, probably left, whatever, don't give a shit. But uh Um quick note so you have so you know my attitude towards Items like behind me on the wall. When I was guiding full time, if you hadn't been with me before and you're fresh off the plane, um, there's a couple things that I always say to my, my new hunters, my new hunter clients. Number one would be hey, just so you know, if you get off the plane and you got a little pee pee and I get you the world record moose tomorrow, you still go home with little pee pee. It doesn't change anything about you. <laughs> it's impossible, right? So I always try to get that across to my fellow outdoors people when they're hunting, angling, or whatever. Just, just to enjoy it. Enjoy the moment. Enjoy the healthy part of it. The natural part of it. Enjoy the beauty, the surroundings, the sets, the smell, the healthy part of the results of your success. That's all you're going to get out of it. That's it. Health and nourishment and memories. That's it. That's it. And also, I'd also say uh, to some hunters, I go, hey, did you bring Stanley? Who's Stanley? The tape measure. Did you bring Stanley? Because there's no room for Stanley here. The only thing that can ruin this hunt is Stanley. <laughs> and uh, you usually get laughs out of that one cause, because it's unfortunate. You know, a lot of people out there, they want... As an example, I had a guy at a sheep hunt one time. He went... It was my guide partner's hunter. They went 12 days of finding a legal ram. We rode up to the highway last hunt of the year. Outfitter said, we got to go back out and try to get this guy a ram in another area where I guided mostly. So I have elected to go. The three of us went. This guy went through hell trying to get his ram, right? Went through hell. Uh, he got to see miles and miles of country. Sweat, blood, tears, anguish, all the emotions, the flavors, disappointment, excitement. And, um, and I took him up Long story short, the horses took off in the night. My guide partner elected to go after them because he wasn't familiar with the zone. I took the guy up to the head of the valley on foot. Minus five million out, snow, hell. And here's a band of rams. And there's a, a legal ram. And he goes, is it legal? Yeah, it's legal. How, can, can you, is it 38 inches? I'm like, no, nope, probably not. It's an inch over the nose for length, so to be illegal for a sheep, the, the horns curl. They curl like this and curl up. On a side view, when the tip of the antler, or the tip of the horn goes above the bridge of the nose, you can shoot it as a legally harvestable ram. Or if you can count the rings to eight years old or older, it's a legal ram. So I said, nope, it's not 30, probably not 38 inches long, but it's an inch over the nose, so it's legal, and it's eight years old, so it's legal both ways. It's a black ram, and you wanted a black cape, and uh, there are... There have been a lot bigger rams around here. But now he's on like day 14. And he goes, wait, well, can you tell him he's 37? I go, nope. 
<laughs> because you just can't. You just don't. Unless you are an absolute guru. But when it gets to a ram like this and a request like that, and then you realize that this guy's about Stanley. Stanley's the tape measure. And I said, it's an inch over the nose. It's eight years old. It's a legal ram. But there's a lot bigger ones around here. And that's all I'm going to tell him. And then he goes, can we get closer? And when, as soon as they say, can we get closer, I know they're going to harvest it. So anyways, we end up getting the ram. And uh, I got him on video saying he was so happy and so stoked and excited. This is freaking awesome, blah, blah, blah. We got his ram. And uh, we get back to camp. And then he put a tape measure on it, and it was 36 and a half inches long. You said it was 37. No, I didn't. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to say it's 37 or 38. I said, it's an inch over the bridge. It's eight years old, and there's way bigger rams running around here at times. And he was euphoric, excited, stoked to have harvested that ram at the end of that long, drawn-out, crazy-ass experience in life. And then he put Stanley the tape measure on it. And because that ram was missing one half inch of sheep porn. He didn't talk to us the whole ride out. He didn't talk to us at the year-end party, and that was it, and he went home miserable. <laughs> wow. Right? Anyway, my quick message to every all my fellow outdoors people who are enjoying hunting season right now, just so you know, if you're a douchebag before you go in the forest and you get that monster game animal, you're still a douchebag when you go home. Ain't gonna change who you are, all right? So concentrate on the good out there, all right? That's my message for the day. Now, let's hear from some people. What's this? This is titled, Reappeared. G'day mate from Australia. I was a railway track inspector, 1995 at Queen's Crown Head Bridge. Tenterfield Creek, north of Tenterfield, New South Wales, northeast corner of the state on the New England Highway. Home of Peter Allen the Singer. I call Australia home. Tenterfield Saddler, another famous song. All right. Me familiar with anything you just said? Flatline. <laughs> That's all right. I was walking across... I was walking across the dis used bridge for trains but for a farmer's safety inspection see the pictures i dropped my canteen bottle with my company name on it gunner dot government unused network railway the canteen floated away down the creek of fresh water flowing west inland at a rapid pace oh well that's gone i'll drink from the creek as it's pristine I was now inspecting the southwest of the state, some 2,000 kilometers away from Tenter Field, several months later. Several months later. I was walking out to a bridge at a town called Hay, yes, Hay, on the Murrumbidgee River, which had some flooding banked from the Murray River, which is the border river of New South Wales slash Victoria slash South Australia, a very long river from Adelaide, South Australia to East Coast, Northwest slash Victoria. The point of saying all the above is water from North Queensland, Darwin, NT, empties into Adelaide, into the sea. I walked towards a little culvert, and yes, sitting there was my bottle on top of the tracks on enougher disused railway enougher i think he meant another see it's australian so i don't know what it might be a word we're not familiar with so i'm reading everything away it's spelled let me read that sentence one more time i walked towards a little culvert and yes sitting there was my gunner bottle on top of the tracks on enough disused railway line sorry on another disused railway line 11 months later not at the culvert, but 300 yards back on the ballast as if you stood it up for me. Okay, to say, Mr. Hominoid of Merwillumba, New South, New South Wales, land of many possums, 
an Aboriginal equals Murwalumba. And there's a photograph, and that's the end of the story. All right, so that sounds pretty crazy. There's the there's the disused bridge in the water, I guess, in that photo right there. I'm going to do that that way, right? It's a little bit of a cheat, but it works. Yeah, I guess that's in retort to my missing knife showing up in my backpack. There's a lot of emails came in in my request back that week in life. Who did it, right? How did it happen? Who did it? Dunno. Sasquatch comparison to human is the title of this email. Hello, Steve. This is interesting enough and compels you to share with your fellow genuine no-bullshit human beings. Please do. A comparison drawing I did to show the difference in size of two male species. Average reported 8-foot male Sasquatch and human 6-foot tall male. I drew a home doorway as another reference for a comparison. Most people are not artistic and don't visualize the frightening size of these beings. I've not seen one as yet, though believe 100% they exist. I spoke to a state trooper and a bounty hunter that has seen one less than 50 feet away. What truly affects a witness to the core are people who laughed in others' faces, ridiculed them about it's a bear, you're drinking or doing drugs. It is that exact individual when they have a first-hand sighting, eye-to-eye -eye contact. Their lives do a complete 180, and every day thereafter is consumed with visions of this being. It, it infests their days. The vision is impossible to get out of their head, according to the testimony and confirmed by some friends and spouse. When they wake up, they see it. They work, they see it. It's a visual mind scar, a curse, according to them, by this 10-second sighting that changed their life forever. They wish they never saw it. And both said as it turned and walked back into the forest, it let out a long woo. Not sure how to spell a sound, but he stated, he stated it shook his internal organs, like going to a zoo when the lions roar. Infrasound, it's called, that can debilitate anyone to the point of several of severe headaches, lack of body function, and so on. I believe these beings slash people know an individual's intent just by eye contact. I believe they're more advanced and intelligent than we are. I'm 66 years old and I never understood how every photo other than the Gimlin film is blurry. I think they're cloaked to a degree. Anytime humans are detected which protects which projects blurry images and digital photography i can't come up with any other reason why this is i'll be out in the washington area next spring olympic peninsula with my ideas and hopes of capturing the next great photo a pipe dream i'm aware of but without hope you got nothing true i'm not hanging out in the dark either they have a huge advantage in darkness. I want to see it with my eyes, not through a night vision electronic. If someone actually thinks you can track them down like a bear or a mountain sheep, you're fantasizing. They are aware of your presence long before you decide which direction you're headed. I'm not an expert, however, if the proof is in the pudding. Someone would have captured one by now or quality photos would be prevalent. I'm not sure how they detect electronics and supposedly can scramble your equipment, but it's something I hear with most high-tech cameras and video reports. They can sense night vision, thermal, etc. I recommend using an old-fashioned 35mm camera with a cable trigger so you don't need to point towards them. You can take a photo by pressing the cable and possibly catch them off guard. Thank you for listening to my thoughts, and I'm already picking out the clothes and armor to wear for the day. You're ready to make a stand on this and step on a few heads. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Bless you, Steve, and our team. Frank Frazetta Jr. And there's your photo. And there you go. There you go. Well, if I, if I think of it, I'll put this in the thumbnail of the video or something. And there it is. There's the drawing. There's your average comparison to one of these beings and a, your average man. In a doorway. I'm guessing fairly accurate.
All right, here's a recent email received. This is titled, Kettle Moraine Encounter Southern Wisconsin. Steve, I've been with you since the beginning of your, of, sorry. I've been with you since the beginning of your YouTube days. Huge fan of what you're doing. F the government, F the mainstream, C liquors, and F the idiots pretending to have a clue on this topic. Might sound harsh, but F them. <laughs> okay, man. Gotcha. I grew up in the Kettle Moraine State Forest in southern Wyoming. Sorry. Wisconsin. Why am I brain farting like so badly today? I grew up riding ATVs and dirt bikes constantly on the south end of Whitewater Lake is a place called Natureland. This is a section of the Kettle Moraine that has 122 acres of trails and wilderness for people to enjoy. It borders the south end of Whitewater Lake. The trails are fairly well used during the summer, but not ever packed with people. When I was younger, some friends and I would run around Natureland doing what dumbass kids do. Just for the record, I lived about 18 minutes from Bray Road. Beast of Bray Road. Not sure if you've heard that story. Supposedly, there was numerous dogman sightings on Bray Road years back. Anyways, some friends and I were running around the trails of Natureland back in the day. Probably about eight of us, eight of us or so, we heard something breaking branches off trail not too far from us. We all stopped to listen. Note, no bears, no cats, nothing too scary around here. Maybe the occasional coyote, whitetails, coons, etc. But whatever this was had to be effing large. So we all got a bit concerned. This thing must have moved because we heard a large snap of a branch. We all took off running like a bunch of lunatics, scared as hell. Me, being one of the fat kids when I was younger, was left in the back of the pack with one other not-so-fast kid. We could hear this effing thing running behind us. And I was literally about to shit myself. Just like out of an effing movie. My cohort trips and falls as we're trying to catch up with the rest of the fast little effers that left us fatties in the dust. As I stopped to help the other tubby kid up from his, from his digger, we both looked back down the trail to see the silhouette of something enormous standing in the trail staring at us. Couldn't make out any detail. It was just a massive black outline of something that looked like it wanted to dismember us. I effing yelled, what the F is that? And just about the same time, this thing dropped down on all fours and bolted off through the timber like a goddamn freight train. Needless to say, we got the F out of there as quick as we could. We could hear the thing busting through the woods, getting farther and farther off from us as we got to the parking lot. Everyone heard the commotion at the parking lot, so we got on our bikes and rode like crazy all the way back home. Not too much of an encounter, but it was enough for me to never go to effing nature land at night ever again. This all happened 35 years ago, and I've only told a handful of people. I actually feel a bit better getting us out there. Usually not too much happens around this small town, but there was a satanic cult around the corner from nature land back in the day. We used to find the picnic tables flipped on top of each other with pentagrams carved in the bottoms covered in blood. <laughs> people are so twisted. That was about the most effed up things we would see besides the one night in the trails. Now that I'm older, not any wiser, I realize this shit needs to be talked about. Life is too short and precious not to. I realized this even more when my 17-year-old son got diagnosed with stage 5 kidney failure. He's my only son. And it's been just him and I since he was two. It really sucks when that one thing that is most important in your life has to go through something like this. Dia dialysis three times a week in addition to high school. He's got a GoFundMe page going since work is hard to do while taking care of him full time. Sure, if you want. If not, it's all good. He's going to be just fine. Yeah, he has to be, lol. I'm not going without my son and best friend anytime soon. 
However, prayers would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for what you do, Steve. You're appreciated more than you know. If shit goes down, my boy and I got your back. Use my name. Like I said before, F him. Duke? Duclo Duclos. Pronounce Duclos. Whitewater, Wisconsin. Duke? Shared. Shared and prayered. We got you. We got you, man. That's unfortunate. You tell your son that we're praying for his ass big time. And uh, we got you back too, right? So, if you... I know times are tough right now for a lot of people. Especially North America. Everywhere in the world, right? But if you got to spare a couple cents, 50 cents a buck, anything. And there you go. There's somebody who could definitely use a little bit of help, right? We all got each other's back here in this group of people. Now, it's funny how some areas can have a lot of, quote, a lot of dogman sightings back in the day and all of a sudden they're gone. Where'd they go? Where'd that thing go, right? Oh, did he give up his territory that was encroached on? <laughs> Sorry, but it's just one of those things. I got a little bit of a soft spot. Sometimes it'll be in my brain in my face especially where i just was looking and doing a 360 and seeing where i am when i show you guys where i am and then when i hear people crying and bleeding hearts about poor sasquatch being encroached on i don't think so sorry proofs in my videos so where'd he go why do they run when you see them why are they so bold and aggressive and confident until you turn and face them and look at them with your eyeballs what is it about our eyes that we have lost possibly lost intimate tune contact with you know what i mean what is it we have lost touch with when it comes to our natural our natural skills right i'm slowly waking up now <laughs> not kidding i was half asleep when i turned this camera on uh yesterday on our way we stopped where um I've been trying to, I know, I just knew there was these two monster bull elk in this particular area. And I really, I don't know, I can't help it. I just, it it's bugs me and I want to find them and see if I can find them. I guess where they go and and try to uh, predict where they might be, where they go, where the trails are. Hopefully call them up and videotape them. Because you can't hunt them unless you get a, a limited entry hunting draw, which is like a lottery ticket. You get a tag and then you might be able to get one. So... I found the zone where I found the two big bulls. I did it. I got them on the trail cameras. And then I wanted to get real good video of them. And then I laced the place up with six cameras. Six. And I was all excited to go pull them, which we did yesterday on the way out to the coast to get to my boat. And they were soaking in the woods for over two weeks. And it was an epic zero fail. Nothing. It's like, oh, man, that sucks. That sucks so bad. Six? Really? And after I got all those animals, including a big cat, on the cameras, there's nothing. Unfortunately, the rut's over, so they go disappear and they filter off into those timbered mountains, right? They go, they go uh, absolutely elusive and disappear. But anyway, what I'm getting at is also what I did then, I flew the drone up to see if I could see them from the air somewhere. Nothing. But when I did that, Ruby, the adventure dog who was just here, she started going absolutely apeshit ferocious. And Sarah had her on her leash, one of those leashes that goes in and out of the handle, you know? And Sarah goes on her walks with Ruby quite often. And Ruby is a natural protector. It's amazing to me to watch. I mean, she's just, she's a puppy, but she's a hundred pound puppy. And it's amazing for me to see the aggression that comes out in a breed that's bred to protect and guard without being trained to directly. And I'll tell you what, she turned into a dog that I would not want on my ass. Whoa. Her fur went up and this ferocious, I'm going to kill you, growl and barks were coming out of this dog who I see as this little innocent puppy. And uh, she was leaping up in the air to try to get that drone. Even when the drone was way up in the sky, she did not give a shit. She didn't know what it was. She thought it was threatening. And I think she's even, she's very protective when she's with Sarah. 
And that dog was going absolutely ballistic. Trying to get the drone. I was like, holy shit. And Sarah's like, see, I told you she gets ferocious. Because she's, as she's been walking, she's been on some bears, unfortunately. And Ruby literally frothed. is coming out of her mouth. And she's almost dragging Sarah down the road trying to get that bear. And when she comes up on people, she said that when she's walking in a couple parks and somebody's coming, Ruby will get in front of her and go against her legs in between her and whoever's coming. It's a great feeling, but that's why I got the dog. Right? Anyways, I'll share that video. There she is. Oh, you innocent little killer. But I'll share that, uh, I'll show you what she was, it's gonna look comical the drone video of her leaping in the air, but I wish I, it had sound. It doesn't have sound, because if you heard the sound and seen her with your real eyes from broadside, see how she just seems to get bigger and so intimidating. And she has another year and a half of growing to do. Don't you? You're gonna, you're a psycho, aren't you? Huh? Hey, buddy. Psycho killer dog. Hey, you're here to protect everybody. I would not want you wanting to hurt me or anybody. That'd be terrifying, hey? Eh? Wouldn't it? You're a good dog. Good dog. Yeah. I would not want to be on the receiving end of one of these breeds of dogs pissed. Hey? Eh? Now she just wants to play with me. <laughs> All right. Who's next? All right. Got another one. Seems to be a long one. I got a dog that wants to play bad. <laughs> All right, listen to this. This is a title from Peggy Anon. Okay to share. All right. R.E. In one eventful day, four and a half hours missing time, disappearing and reappearing friend, Sabe or unidentified force restricting car movement. Sabe calls and ground vibration. Wow. Hello, Steve. This is Peggy Anon. Peggy Anon, I hope your tooth issue has been resolved and you are on the mend. The story below is relayed to me by my girlfriend, whose brother is the avid hiker who was photographed, who has photographed many Sabe prints in the dry washes of Arizona. I have mentioned the fact, the fact, that fact to you in previous email. This series of unexplainable events happened yesterday while, quote, Kevin, end quote, her brother, and a new hiking friend, quote, Dundee, end quote, were hiking near an ancient Hohokam burial ground in Arizona. In Arizona, sorry. Although I haven't had the time to watch all your videos, this story incorporates many of the things reported by your viewers who have shared their experiences and includes other phenomena I have heard others report on various YouTube channels I follow. Yesterday at 7.30 a.m., Kevin and Dundee plotted a hike towards the mountains located near an ancient Hohokam burial ground in search of new petroglyphs and geocache, and a geocache. After arriving at the parking area, they both got ready for the three-mile hike to the mountain range. Every weekend, they embark on adventures, meticulously documenting everything they encounter. They began their journey hiking towards the base of a mountain. As they near the base, they hear a very strange noise approaching. Dundee turned to Kevin and asked him if he hears it. Kevin says, I hear something. What do you hear? Dundee says, it sounds like the roar of a plane coming very, coming very far off in the distance. Kevin tells Dundee he hears what sounds like, quote, a bunch of Indians riding towards them, maybe hundreds or even thousands, end quote. He also hears the rhythmic, the rhythmic beats of hooves on the ground, resembling the presence of, of numerous horses. The noise grows so intense that they scan every direction in their expansive surroundings. Despite being able to see for miles around, there is no visible source approaching them. However, they can clearly sense the ground vibrating, resonating with what seems to be the powerful hoofbeats of horses. They reach the base of the mountain range where a cluster of immense rocks stand. They start exploring the rocks, meticulously documenting the petroglyphs they encounter. Dundee then called out to Kevin, I'm going to go around the other side of the rocks to see what's there. 
Kevin diligently documents and photographs every petroglyph within the cluster of rocks. Before he realizes it, he finds himself atop the mountain. And to his surprise, Dundee is nowhere to be found. Standing at the mountain's summit, he scans both sides of its base and realizes Dundee is missing. He promptly calls, calls him, asking, Where are you, buddy? Dundee responds, I'm down here in the sand wash examining some pottery. I'll be up in a minute. Kevin acknowledges with a simple, okay, and starts documenting the picturesque scenery from the mountaintop. As he looks down towards the sand wash, he takes more pictures. Growing concerned when he doesn't spot Dundee, after about 45 minutes pass with no sign of Dundee, Kevin makes another call, anxiously asking, Buddy, where are you? Dundee answers the phone, asserting, I told you I'm right here in the sand wash looking at the pottery. Kevin expresses concern, stating, You said you were coming, but that was 45 minutes ago. Dundee reassures, I'll be right there. They hang up, and as Kevin turns around, Dundee is standing right in front of him. Kevin asks Dundee, where were you? Dundee said, I told you, dude, I was at the bottom in the sand wash looking at pottery. Kevin tells Dundee, no, I took pictures of the wash while I was talking to you on the phone. You were nowhere in the wash. He then points down to the wash and shows him the wash is on the other side of the mountain and they hadn't even explored that area yet. Suddenly they find themselves back at the base of the mountain, with a sense of missing time. Several hours have passed and they decide it's, the, it's best to head back towards the car, concluding their hike for the day. They begin their descent down the hill. Upon reaching the vehicles, Kevin walks to his vehicle, unlocks the door, places his keys on the driver's seat and starts cleaning up for the journey home. He set his walking stick with the attached camera between the seats and wipes his hands. Dundee comes over and asks him if he would join him on a small trip approximately three miles further down the road. He mentions a geocache he'd like to check out. Kevin agrees to join him, and they get in the vehicle, heading towards the geocache location. After driving approximately three miles, Kevin asked, How much farther is the geocache? He said it was only three miles. Dundee, looking at his geocache map, appears puzzled and says, I don't know, dude, this thing keeps changing. And now says we have an additional four and a half miles to go. They notice an ornate cactus to the right, and Kevin asks Dundee if he could please pull over so that he could document and take a picture of it. This is the only time that Kevin gets out of the car. He walks over, documents pictures, adding to his collection, Returning to the vehicle, he asked Dundee once more, How far is it to this geocache? Dundee replied, It says four and a half miles. Kevin mentions, Well, it took us 30 minutes to just go this last three miles. They resume driving and talking about the things they're seeing, and one and a half hours has passed. Upon reaching the geocache, Kevin remains in the vehicle, awaiting Dundee's return with his loot, once Dundee is back in the vehicle, they turn around and head back in the direction they'd just come from. To their surprise, after 30 minutes, they arrive back at the same ornate cactus. Kevin, bewildered by the speed of their return, questions Dundee. This doesn't make any sense. How do we get back here so quickly? Dundee, with a puzzled expression, responds, I guess I found a quicker road. Kevin points out that there is only one road in and one road out. Despite this, they continue on the road for another seven minutes and find themselves back at their vehicle. Dundee parks his Jeep and Kevin steps out, heading towards his own vehicle. Dundee, out of habit, locks his Jeep and calls out, I'm going to go pee. Kevin, busy cleaning up from the day's journey, notices that his camera is no longer attached to his hiking stick. He informs Dundee about the missing camera and Dundee suggests, maybe you left it at the ornate cactus. Frustrated, Kevin responds, I didn't take it with me. The only things I took were the keys to my car, my cell phone, and my drink. They thoroughly searched the car, its surroundings, and underneath it. But Kevin's camera was nowhere to be found. Kevin was deeply upset as the camera contained a significant collection of documented photos and videos. 
Dundee speculates that he might have inadvertently taken the camera without realizing it and possibly dropped it somewhere around the ornate cactus. Consequently, they decide to hop back in Dundee's truck and travel three miles back to the ornate cactus to check if the camera is there. Kevin's deeply concerned because he's certain that he did not take the camera. He had, he had left it attached to the walking stick. He drives. He, sorry, he tries to convey this to Dundee, who remains convinced that Kevin must have taken it on the trip. They eventually return to the ornate cactus, having completed another 30-minute drive, attentively scanning the treacherous road for any signs of the camera that might have fallen out of the vehicle, that it remains elusive. They walk around the ornate cactus, finding no trace of the camera. Kevin eventually resigns, saying, It's all right, I just have to get a new camera. They both hop back into Dundee's vehicle and head toward Kevin's vehicle. Approximately halfway back from the ornate cactus, Kevin notices something in the road. They both get out to investigate. There in the middle of the road, without a speck of dust on it, is Kevin's camera. At this point, both of them are tired and perplexed by what is happening. They don't understand how the camera could have mysteriously disappeared from the vehicle and ended up in the middle of the road where they've never stopped before. After reaching Kevin's vehicle, he unlocked his door and placed his keys in the driver's seat. He secured the camera back in his protective case and proceeded to wash his hands and face before entering the vehicle. Upon completion, he went to get into his vehicle but couldn't locate his keys. They had mysteriously disappeared. In frustration, he started yelling and Dundee, curious, approached, asking, Why are you screaming now, dude? Kevin exclaimed, I can't find my effing keys. My keys just disappeared off the seat. Dundee suggested, maybe you left them in my truck. Kevin refuted, there's no way they're in your truck. When we got here, you got out, I got out, you locked the doors to your Jeep, and I needed my keys to get in my vehicle. Kevin unlocked his car, placed the keys in the driver's seat, and began putting away all his hiking gear. When he reached down to grab his keys off the seat, they were gone. Dundee, frustrated, became upset with Kevin and told him to shut up. He proceeded to unlock the door of his Jeep and look inside. Kevin spotted. Dundee spotted Kevin's keys in the passenger seat and said, See, dude, I told you, you left him in my Jeep. At this point, Kevin was infuriated because his friend didn't comprehend that he, need, that he needed those keys to access his vehicle. There was no way he could have unlocked his car and then put the keys back into his friend's truck, which is locked. Kevin told his sister Kevin told his sister Dundee always locks the doors. He is almost obsessed in doing it. Kevin is always joking about him being paranoid. Frustrated, Kevin gets into his vehicle, starts it, and tells Dundee, Dude, this is all screwed up. I'm out of here. I'll wait until your car starts before I leave. Kevin gives him the thumbs, thumbs up sign, and Dundee is off in a flash and gone. After seeing Dundee pull out, Kevin put his vehicle in gear to drive forward, but it doesn't move. He can hear the tires spinning, but the vehicle refuses to move forward. It feels as though something is keeping his car from moving forward. He then shifts the car in reverse and backs up, turning his wheels to exit the parking area. However, as he puts it back into drive to move forward, he's met with an unknown force that is pushing his head back. Deciding to put the vehicle in reverse, he backs all the way out to the main road. Although he makes it out to the main road safely, his mind is racing with all the bizarre events that had unfolded. Peggy. Postscript. Today I learned that Kevin reviewed the videos on his GoPro and the photos he had captured with his phone. He discovered that he was missing four and a half hours of video and the corresponding photos taken during that time. End of email. And there you go, there's another dub, <laughs> WTF moment, right? We're starting to see a little bit of a similar pattern materializing again. Missing time, missing, missing time, right? Just like Kevin mentioned earlier too about his friend hiking out of that creek area near Mount Curry and was way ahead excuse me, from the rest of the group. Next thing you know, he's in the rear. There's something going on that I have no knowledge, uh, no experience with 
that I can't comment on. I can't really say much about it. All I know is, is that for me, listening to the people along with all you, something's up. Something's up with, with time, energy. Something's very confusing. This is a very confusing, what the hell's going on pattern starting to form, right? And how many people are going to really want to talk about those experiences or even put them to text, paper, whatever? Right? Very confusing. Alarming. I wonder how many people are watching this channel and, and can relate. I'm sure we're going to hear from them. Crazy. All right, who's next? What do we got? If you can hear the hum in the background, that's just my little electric heater that I had built into the wall here, blasting out some heat so it's not so freezing in here. Adirondack Bigfoot Encounter. Hey Steve, my name is Caleb and I live in upstate New York. After hearing your latest story about the lady in the Adirondack Mountains in New York, I decided I would share my story. Now I did not see one, but I know what it was. It was back in 07 or 08. My friend and I were camping in the southern Adirondack Mountains. First off, the Adirondack State Park is 6 million acres of forever wild forest, which means no logging and no motorized vehicles in the woods. There are some very remote places, and the only way to get there is to walk or maybe fly in with a float plane. Anyways, the two of us were camping, and we were at the edge of this small lake miles from the nearest house or main road sitting by a fire. It was about 1 a.m. in the morning, and all of a sudden we heard what sounded like two rocks being smashed together with serious power. It was about 8 to 10 loud cracks then stopped. We were scared, frozen, and just looked at each other. About 30 to 45 seconds later, it did the same thing, but from a different location, maybe a third of a mile away from the first time. We took off running to our tent that was about 200 yards away. We wanted to leave, but we were too scared to make the hike out of there. Our brains were racing, trying to decide what would have made those powerful rock smashes. It came down to two things, either a human or something we can't explain that isn't supposed to exist. We ruled out a human because of the terrain in the area the noise came from was steep rocky cliffs that are almost impassable during the day when you can see, let alone in the pitch dark. If someone were up there, they would need a flashlight and we would have we would have saw, sorry, if someone were up there, they would need a flashlight and we would have saw that so we were puzzled and scared. That's all that happened that night. It was stuck with me and my friend and we talk about it often when we were together still trying to explain it. My friend that was with me had another experience in the same spot a few weeks later where rocks and sticks were being thrown at him. He shined his light and saw glowing red eyes that were eight feet off the ground. But that's for him to tell. He got out of there quick, and neither of us spent much time in there anymore. Thank you very much for what you're doing. Feels good to tell the story to someone that believes me. That sounds a little familiar. I might have read that. If I did, oh well, it's harmless. It's a popular area. A, a lot of emails come from that area. A lot. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, okay, seems like this one might be an experience. Sometimes they aren't. This title Sasquatch Incident. Hi Steve, you're a really good friend of mine is a big Sasquatch guy. We played in a band together for... We played in a band together 25 years ago on the island. I'm guessing Vancouver Island. We both grew up on the island as well. He's a big fan of your YouTube videos. Because him and I are tight, and he's a believer. We like to call them knowers. <laughs> I shared with him an experience I had with a childhood friend near Sprout Lake. Summer, super hot day on a logging road that runs parallel to and above the Pacific Rim Highway. Returning to the campground after a hike up to Ward Lake. 
All right, for the curious, let's just write this way a little bit. He suggested I reach out to you. My other friend and I were around 12 to 13 years old. He had his dog with him. And as I've always been a believer as well, if we'd just seen the Bigfoot cross the road, we would have reported it, told our parents, taken the disbeliever heat, no issue. Just a sighting. But it was more than that. There is a lost time component to it as well, like an hour. Hmm. Random coincidence there this morning, right? Which we cross-verified later that night as we were both wearing watches and always timed our hikes. Plus, we had to be back at the campground to have dinner with our families, check in, that kind of thing. It was really, really weird. Plus, Every time we tried to probe the lost time in our minds, we'd get that almost debilitating icy chill. I still get it to this day, almost 40 years later. Like we're programmed not to go there in our minds. So, we made a pact at the time to not tell anyone because we didn't want to be labeled lunatics. Since then, I've told maybe three other people. Anyway, I'm not looking for publicity or free therapy, lol. I'm fine just a regular business guy normal life other than being a trophy trout junkie catch and release but my drummer pal told me you cited another bc sasquatch incident on your channel that also had a lost time component which was encouraging to hear and i thought you might be interested in my incident and maybe shed some light on it there was clearly a sasquatch type creature on the road after his dog freaked out just before it came out. It looked at us. And then lights out for almost an hour. And we came to in a huge culvert we'd used to cross under the highway to get back to Sprout. What? Let me read that again. It looked at us and then lights out for almost an hour. And we came to in a huge culvert we used to cross under the highway to get back to Sprout. That was five minutes away from where we were on the logging road when we saw it looking at us. The weirdest thing that ever happened to me. And despite a handful of near-death experiences after that, after that commercial, oh, sorry. Okay, after that, hold on a minute. I got gotcha. you. The weirdest thing that ever happened to me, and despite a handful of near-death experiences, after that commercial and sport fishing for springs and halibut on the west coast, is the only memory, or absence of memory, that still, almost four decades later, still sends an icy chill up my spine when I try to probe the last time portion. If you're interested, feel free to circle back for more details and a map diagram I did for my Sasquatch buddy. Congrats on your channel success, and I hope your guiding business is going well. Cheers from Calgary, KC. Holy shit, dude. Oh my god, that was in 2020? You sent that? Damn, eh? It's hard not to feel a little bit of a twang of guilt when I see the dates on some of these emails, but there's nothing I could do about it. <laughs> there's nothing I could do about it. There's so many. But anyways, back to that email. All right, this is all I know. Down the lake, down at that far end towards Eucula Tofino end. I know there's been a lot of sightings on the highway there, obviously. There's also been some people reported hearing screams while they're on one of those houseboats. You can rent houseboats, excuse me, and shit down there. And they could hear screams from atop above the highway and other screams on the other side of the lake, back and forth. I took note of that one. Uh... There was a lot of sightings around Sprout Lake, a lot of sightings around my house right here. Now, if you're still following the channel, uh, definitely email us back with whatever you got. And also email back to us a description of what you saw on the road. You miss that out. That was missing in your email. No big deal. We've had the description a gazillion times, but we still want to hear it. Came to in the culvert. Now, was your sh were your shoes and socks and everything still intact in the right position? Everything was, you're dressed the same way when you left the house. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm assuming when you came to. Also, were you laying down? Were you on your, were your 
Were you in the fetal position? Were you laying on your back? Were you face down? Were you in a sleeping position when you came to? Were you uncomfortable? Did it, were you cold? Were you cold from being on the ground? Were you bruised? Pain? Anything? Side by side? Spread out apart? 10 feet apart? What, what was the deal with that wake up moment? You know what I mean? That's, that's really, really, really alarming. Don't you think? You guys? How do you go through that experience, especially today, and share it, right? I guess it's easier now. What am I saying? I mean, we're here now. But the good thing is we're here now. It's funny. It, I mean, uh, as I go, I'm just so focused on trying to get more all, every email heard and then carry on, carry on with all my other tasks. But it's just recently, this past month, where I've it's really, it's really uh, smacked me in the face the fact that what we have done here is very very big medicine right this is very very big medicine to have so many people come forward and share everything they got and it's only really seriously this past month I'm really seriously realizing the impact of so much truth and what it's doing what it's the knowledge is bringing forward to all of us right and you can't deny it it is so freaking powerful you know the amount of people that have uh, the small amount of people it's amazing how much power an individual can actually have when it comes to manipulating human beings their minds their actions whatever it's amazing to me to see how one two even three whatever people what they can pull off if they're given how do they do it they're given the lens, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. They're given access to that mainstream route of delivery to so many people. <coughs> Excuse me. I must have got a chunk of that fur in my throat. <clears> throat> Bloating around in here. And um, it's just amazing amazing for me to, to witness, figure out, see, observe, and correct, attempt to correct that big hiccup of giving an individual or a small group of people, an organization, whatever, that power over all of you, all of us as a group, right? It's amazing. But to see how it turns around and such how the, it's such a significant display example of how it turns around in such a big way. When you take that power from those people and give it back to the people, I'm babbling, aren't I? But the truth and the facts and the power and the change, the patterns, right? The patterns are huge. What a huge, huge thing is the patterns. Once you get, I don't know how many thousands of people, you guys, tens of thousands of people that isn't, who have been successfully suppressed all these years. That's amazing, right? From what we see and what we know and what we're learning today, it's, it really strikes me as amazing at how so few individuals can suppress all of that truth, in fact, from the world for so long. So bizarre. But what a fun, exciting thing for me to realize the power of the power of the people of honesty and free speech is incredible. Is it? Isn't it? It's just incredible to see uh, see how this is working out. Wow, right? I'm I'm really really excited to start to get the all the facts from the patterns from the truth from all the people put together, so we can clearly see it in your face and read it out loud. <laughs> right? What a ball of knowledge! Holy shit! What a ball of frickin' knowledge to share. All right, that's just been my brain is emptying out through my lips. Without thinking too much about it. Now. Yeah.